So, welcome to the first of two talks. This is intro to Prometheus. Right after, we'll have a deep dive to Prometheus. You're welcome to attend both. There is some slight overlap for basically people who don't attend both. Um, yeah. I'm Richard. I'm part of Prometheus team. I do a lot of things, amongst others, building a data center, which is quite fun and challenging. And this is Frederick. Hey, uh, so yeah, I'm Frederick. I work at Red Hat um, and I work on Prometheus and Kubernetes and basically everything that connects the two projects. So, so we have this yes. actually. Yes, we do. Uh, so uh, in this talk, uh, we are talking not just about Prometheus, uh, but we because we want to talk about some of the fundamentals that um, Prometheus has introduced. So we're going to do about one third um, of uh, Prometheus. So I'm too close to you. Um, <laughs> um, then we're we're going to talk about observability um, in general, and then uh, we're going to have some time for everyone to ask questions. Uh, so a quick show of hands, who has heard of Prometheus? Hopefully that's everyone, that is everyone. Uh, so who is considering to use Prometheus? Hands? Okay, also maybe like two people less. Maybe we can convince you um, afterwards. Um, so who's already trialing Prometheus? Okay, and who's using it in production? Okay, that's pretty good. Hopefully... After today's yeah. talks, um, there will be more. So uh, let's get started. Um, so Prometheus um, is a monitoring system that was heavily inspired by uh, Google's Borgmon. And um, if you're familiar with the history of Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes is basically inspired by Borg, the scheduler uh, used within Google. Uh, and similarly, um, Prometheus is inspired by Borgmon, which was the monitoring system um, to monitor workload within uh, Borg. Um, so what that means is, uh, like, what, what makes up a monitoring system? And um, in the case of Prometheus, uh, that means it's a time series database, and it can do some alerting based on that data that it collects. Um, and that data is really, like, it's super, super simple. It's a super simple data model. It's really, every sample is quite literally on disk, a UN64, that's the timestamp, and a float64, that's the value. This is literally what we write into our storage. Um, and how Prometheus does all of this is that applications need to expose their metrics in the Prometheus format. Uh, maybe you, you attended uh, Richie's uh, session yesterday on open metrics because um, Richie, among others, um, is standardizing the format that Prometheus has introduced um, so that, for example, um, companies that need a standard like network switches, um, companies that produce network switches, they need some standard um, in order to be, um, to, so we can like force them to implement it more or less. Um, <laughs> Forest. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, and but obviously not everything is already instrumented with Prometheus metrics, especially because it's a, let's say, custom format. Um, so that means um, that a lot of systems that that don't do that, we have extra software that we call exporters, um, and so what they do is they query, however. Um, a system exposes metrics. For example, um, in SQL databases, they often you can you, you can often do use the SQL language to extract um, metrics from the system, and the exporter would then convert that to the Prometheus format. And um, Prometheus itself is only uh, like exploratory querying. Uh, so if you want to do dashboarding or something, we we recommend using Grafana for that. So a very simple example of how Prometheus works. Um, in this case, we have an application that is instrumented with Prometheus metrics. Uh, so we're just going to have one metric, which is the request count. So that's a counter. Um, and it's, like, it's super simple. Prometheus just scrapes every interval. And by default, that's every 15 seconds, but it's configurable. Um, it just scrapes 
our application's metrics. And whenever it does that, so it, at um, time t0, it ingests that timestamp because our um, application hasn't actually received any traffic. So at t0, the counter is zero. But then uh, it does start to receive some production traffic. Um, and our interval, interval passes again. So 15 seconds, for example, have passed in this, this case. Uh, so we attempt another scrape. And whatever our application exposes for that metric, then we write into our time, time series database. And this is essentially um, one series of uh, one time series, all the samples that we're collecting here. Um, so um, and one, one more thing that I wanted to um, make sure we understand here is Prometheus even when even does this even if no uh, metrics have changed right so in that case it would just again write down the same metric um, obviously that's optimized away in terms in terms of the storage but um, Prometheus always collects this data for eternity um, so why why uh, is Prometheus good? Um, why, do, why do people like using Prometheus? Well, um, it integrates, for example, with Kubernetes. And so um, in super high uh, dynamically environments like Kubernetes, where pods come and go all the time, um, that means that we have super high churn of time series data, um, which Prometheus w has specifically been uh, optimized for. And so it works really, really well in all of those cases, and that's not necessarily the same situation for other monitoring systems. Um, and it's not a hierarchy. So, so some other monitoring systems have a hierarchy of metrics. In Prometheus, it's just label-based. Um, so any combination uh, of labels make up the unique time series. And you can query all of the time series by using a subset of those labels. And uh, we have developed a specific query language for this, uh, which is called PromQL. And we'll see that later. Um, but really, Prometheus is about super simple and reliable operation. So the pull model allows us to do this, because if there was a, a push model, we would have to worry about scaling this uh, horizontally or something. With Prometheus, it can just start backing off um, and not just die. Um, so, yes, I've mentioned this a couple of times now, and I've dem demonstrated that Prometheus is a pull-based system. Um, and typically, what we, what we want to do with Prometheus is white box monitoring. So we actually want to understand what is our process doing and how is it behaving. Um, but it turns out black box monitoring, in some cases, is also important. So sometimes we just want to make sure that when our users request our website, that they actually get uh, some response that we're expecting. So that for cases like that, we have implemented the black box um, exporter. Um, yeah. And Prometheus thus far has held back on like a security story, um, as in the Prometheus server itself it just is just an HTTP server. And if you wanted to secure that, you would have to put uh, an Nginx in front of it and do whatever authentication you want to do. Um, but we've, in the last developer summit, uh, we've decided that, um, that there is going to, to be some support, but we still have some things to figure out because once we start to introduce security features, we need an escalation process and so on. Uh, so all of that is in, in progress. So um, I already uh, showed earlier um, a time series visualization, uh, but really was uh, a time series just is, is what, what the name says, it's a series of samples um, over time, and we can query all of that. Um, and in Prometheus, we differentiate in a couple of uh, primitive types. So we have what we uh, saw earlier was a counter, um, so something that's monotonically increasing, um, and a gauge, uh, which can change over time. And uh, we also have a couple of other um, types, but they're actually just compound types made up of uh, counters and gauges. Um, so yeah, Prometheus is super, super efficient. And this is really important uh, 
because we we want to we want to make sure that um, obviously our resources are used in a, in the most efficient way possible. But if we have the a super um, efficient system, that also means we have less infrastructure to run, right? Um, so again, that kind of goes into um, Prometheus being a reliable system um, that's simple to operate. Um, and if you look at the data like in memory, um, we saw the UN64 and the float64, and that's really just uh, 16 bytes. So sometimes um, there were a couple of talks uh, about Prometheus were 16 bytes at scale. Um, so yeah, um, and how we actually manage to do all of this efficiently on disk is uh, we use special compression formats, and so we actually get it down to like 1.36 bits. Uh, but I think that should be bytes. bytes yeah. Yes, um, <laughs> um, on average. So this is it's super 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 simple and super cheap uh, to have metrics. So have lots of metrics. Um, so one of the idioms in Prometheus is um, collect first, ask later. So we always want all this data because at the point when we need it. Uh, we, we don't know upfront when what kind of data we're going to need, and it's going to be better to have it than not have it when you're investigating issues. Um, so I mentioned the uh, Prometheus exposition format, and it's really simple. So what we're seeing here is um, just the name of the metric followed by um, a set of labels, and uh, actually the name is also just internally a label. It just turns out that um, it's easier to uh, cognitively understand uh, when the metric name is somewhat um, special. And then just the value of that particular metric. And um, yeah, so I mentioned we created PromQL for querying purposes. Um, and we just did this because um, Prometheus data is vector based, basically. and uh, all of the aggregations and everything that we do typically with Prometheus, are, it, it, was, it just feels a little bit unnatural uh, to use um, SQL for that. And so uh, PromQL was created for that. Um, yeah, and, and Prometheus is really great for exploratory querying, as I said earlier. But if you want to do dashboarding, do use Grafana. They're great. They're also here. Um, they're great people to talk to. Um, yeah, and actually, they're take also taking away the one feature that we were good at, which is exploratory um, querying. They're actually adding this to Grafana as well, so you maybe won't need the Prometheus UI at all anymore. Um, That's me. Okay. <laughs> um, test, test. No. Okay. Let's do it like this. So the type is already fixed and pushed. <laughs> Um, so again, um, this is the second third of this talk, and we deliberately chose to not just talk about Prometheus. We also want to talk about operations and obs observability for a very simple reason. Um, chances are, if you're starting with Prometheus, you will most likely not have been exposed to most of those concepts, which we kind of just anticipate that they're built into the structure of anyone who's, who, who makes a process or just anything around Prometheus. So this is something which Prometheus itself works well and it scales really, really well, but to get the full value you have to actually consider maybe changing or adapting some things of how you do operations. And that's basically why we have these slides as well. Just because th these are basically intertwined. You can't have good observability without good monitoring tools and vice versa, or at least you can't use them without good observability concepts. So first and foremost, the concept of toil. Anyone who's read the SRE book is familiar with that definition. The short version is toil is defined as something as, as work, which is manual, which is which is repetitive, which does not create any lasting value, and it roughly scales linearly with what you're doing. Amount of numbers, uh, amount of users, amount of services, whatever. So, <coughs> and you have to reduce this toil, because if you're all the time just running around and fixing fires, then you won't have time to actually sit down, think, and engineer your systems. Um, obviously, you need to have this path to to keep your old stuff running while adapting new stuff, which means there's extra effort. 
which means you have to keep this effort low. And also you have to strive for immediate benefits, because else the teams will not be willing to actually engage with all this new stuff, because just more work. They have their old stuff, and now they have this new th system. Why should they change? So there should be quick wins. You should be looking for people who are maybe in different teams who want to do the same thing, and when one of you achieves something, be open about this, tell your team members about this and say, hey, okay, we achieved this and that thing and it was way better because we did X instead of Y. So this helps gaining trust of people and this is really, really important. And also, as you reduce this toil, those other people realize that they have more and more time for actually lasting benefits in their work, which is always nice to have. It's really annoying. Um, then the next thing, most of us like to sleep. Um, most of us maybe don't get to sleep as much as we'd like to. Um, and there is this concept of pager fatigue where you just, oh my God, it's the pager again. I don't want to even look at it because it's either really, really bad or it's just completely random stuff which I don't care about. You have to avoid this. So unless something is actually actionable and someone can actually do something specific with this, it should not be an alert. And if it's not urgent, it should also not be an alert. If there's something important, for example, disk at whatever percentage, that's something you can deal with in during business hours. If over the weekend this becomes in, this could run out in two hours, which you can do with Prometheus, with, lin with linear predict, then it becomes an alert. Then you can start paging people. So this distinction between importance and urgency is really, really important. You can use Prometheus for capacity plani uh, planning, and you should. Of course, again, this prevents any outages. If whoever did something doesn't have a playbook and no concept of how it's actually to be operated, it does not go into production, period. You might not be able to make that call, but you should at least be able to make that argument. And if you don't know what you're actually monitoring, what your service level indicators and objectives and agreements are, it also shouldn't go into production. Of course, this is then something you can't actually operate. If the people who built it or who designed it don't even know what, what you're aiming for, how should you be the one who then kind of makes it work if they don't even know what the working state is and what the target of the working state is? Another thing, um, I, I, I really like that quote. Uh, it's mine, but yeah, <laughs> I still like it. Um, you can talk for hours with a software engineer about a specific function or maybe LVVM versus something else or all these things, and they really deeply care. Try it with your manager, try this with the CEO, and you'll fail because they don't care. Because in their world, they have different things which matter to them, which is, is totally fine. So they care about different aspects of this big picture which you hopefully made. Um, and show them what they need to th what they need to see. The managers they care about proper execution of whatever process as long there's a, as long as there is revenue because who cares there is revenue. Um, the architects they actually care about defining all these things and that it's done cleanly. They might even be too concerned about executing very cleanly on it, but they want to have this defined in a pristine, perfect condition. Service owners, product owners, they just want to have quick information which enables them to do pricing, to do other planning, to do marketing, whatever. They want to have quick insights into what has actually happened with the product you're building. Team leads, they want their people to be happy. Of course, happy people are, are good people. If everyone is just happy and uh, unhappy and trying to get out of work, um, chances are you'll not have a very good operations team. And the HR operators, uh, a lot of whom will be sitting in this audience, um, yeah, reduce your toil and increase your sleep. It helps with your health. Um, so, but again, this this whole observability story of making things able to to un to be understood by humans and by machines. This is like one thing, and all of these stories are part of this. It's just a different part of that picture. So you show that one guy what he needs to see and that other girl what she needs to see and everyone just gets to the same conclusion because they basically agree they just want that things work um, and you have to show them this if you want to exert this change within your company your team whatever postmortems they should happen um, mistakes should not happen but they do happen so it's really really important to have an a specific error 
once, maybe twice, but not more often. Ideally, you have it once, or ideally even zero times, but it shouldn't be more than once. It should definitely not be more than twice. But to actually enable this, you have to have a trusting environment where people are open about talking what they did and what they did might have done wrong or didn't really think about it or whatever. If they fear that there will be immediate or delayed repercussions for what they did, they will never ever be open about what they actually did. And this isn't helping. Of course, you will not be learning from this. You will just be hearing something which is a made-up story instead of what actually happened. So this is really, really important. You have to have post-mortems and they have to be blame-free. You have to be precise in what went wrong, who did what. You don't have to name and shame them, but an engineer that X, and that has to be specific and correct. Don't kill those people. That's a learning opportunity. And they have to be able to trust you, and you trust them, and this builds better teams. Then you have this leverage thing. You want to install Prometheus. Okay, you have a new tool. Um, great. It's one amongst three dozen. Yay. Um, that doesn't really work. So what you really want to have is you want to ideally have as few tools as possible which can support you as much as you need them to. And with a system where all the information is going in into one system, it's a lot easier to do correlations and, and just data exploration into what you're doing. Um, you can immediately, if your data center, like your physical data center, is is being logged in the same way or, or monitored in the same way as your as your end user services, you can graph the uptake in in your uh, services against the actual power load. Easy. Optical networks against outside temperature. I had one link which went down if it went too cold or too warm too quickly. Then we had an outage on that link. It took us months to find this. Uh, I'm not saying I would have found this with Prometheus, to be honest, but still, uh, at least I would have had the ability, because at that time we didn't have anything which was correlating or, or storing all this together. And lots and lots of those things can then happen, especially because metrics are usually the starting point. You have your alerts on metrics, you have your, uh, you have your dashboards on those metrics, and you start to go into your data, into your logs, into your traces, into whatever you have, usually from, hmm, this is funny in that graph, let's see. Or maybe there's an alert, let's see. So as you have more data in one combined system, this, this stepping stone into your observability path, into what you're about to do, that's a lot easier. So this is basically the same thing. You have this one source of truth, um, but all of a sudden, if you do this right, your own dashboard does not disagree with the dashboard of the product manager anymore. And the customer service reports use the exactly same data, so everyone actually agrees on what happened. This makes it even more important that good data is in the system, but you don't have this customer calling, hey, I saw X, and no one else can see X, because they have a different system for historical reasons. That's really, really great to have one single source of truth, of course, everyone cares about that one system. Instead of one team caring about that system and another caring about that system, they all work together on one system. So, and I hope you have lots of questions. Don't be shy, yeah. A kind of a beginner's question. How how would you uh, conceptually compare uh, Prometheus to something like StatsD? Um, oh, so Prometheus is is based on having really well structured data, and StatsD is not very well structured. So and also, I mean, there is push and pull and blah 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 blah. There's lots of things, but at a very basic level, um, you you have this this concept of of having a minimum of good metadata on your data before you start this exploration into your data. And then there's just a lot more powerful tools built into this thing where you're just doing, for example, PromQL. It's, it's, it might be hard to learn initially, but it's one language you use for all the things. You use it, you use it for your graphing, for your dashboarding, for the same language is used for alerting, for creating new data out of that system, for exporting into JSON. It's all one thing. So this this whole it's a lot more usable and a whole a real framework to really do stuff with your data and that's not even scratching the surface there's tons more 
Uh, could w either or both of you speak to the relationship between Prometheus and Cube Prometheus? He's doing Kubernetes. I'm Prometheus and OpenMetrics. So, uh, yeah, I actually maintain that project. So, um, Kube Prometheus is just a collection of uh, different components and like that just ends up being a collection of manifests uh, for Kubernetes to run Prometheus on Kubernetes. Um, so, does that answer the question already or? So as I understand it, there's more overlap between what you just described in Prometheus Operator and Cube Prometheus. Prometheus Operator has a lot of appeal. Uh, Cube Prometheus, when I tried to understand the version that someone set up and then left the company, broke my brain. Um, trying to, I mean, J JSON it just seems like a layer of complexity hiding the opinionated bits of Prometheus, Kubernetes specific Prometheus metrics that I cared about. But trying to break through that layer was, was messy. Uh, adding to that the declaration in Cube Prometheus that it's all experimental and subject to change at any time, I can't tell how much effort I should put into understanding this or if I should just try to extract the opinionated bits of it that I do care about and put those into a Prometheus operator system that I can understand. Okay, uh, yeah, that was a lot. Um, I'll, I'll try to break that down. Um, so Kube Prometheus being experimental is largely because it's made up of 10 to 15 components. Uh, so it's hard to give any kind of uh, guarantee on stability because it relies on the stability of each of those projects, which most of them are pre-stable versions. So that's the biggest reason why uh, Kube Prometheus is like, marked as experimental. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really just about rendering out manifests. Um, and it's just like anything you deploy on Kubernetes, you want to make sure that what you deploy, you understand, right? And it's just, that's going to be a lot of work because it is 15 components. And you're going to need all of this to um, monitor Kubernetes successfully. Um, yeah. Uh, two questions, maybe. Uh, do you have any plans to support uh, ClickHouse uh, as an adapter instead of Influx and for the time series? And the second question is more about the pull and pull push. Now that you're running in Kubernetes, the scaling I issue is not non non issue. So what you said that uh, you know when you have to uh, get pushed and you need to scale that that you run out of scaler and you, you just do that. I mean, there's a scalability issue with pulling from lots of remote uh, places. But there's no, so I mean, if you need to scale out, either you do what, what we recommend, you put more Prometheus, or you can uh, look at Thanos or Cortex, which basically come from Prometheus. Um, there is no inherent, functionally, pull and push are completely the same. It's just a question of where you're putting the complexity, where you're putting computation, where you're maintaining state. There is a lot of, like in the real world, there, there are actual differences, but co conceptually it's completely the same. And if you, um, there's a lot of scenarios in which it's easier to scale when you have a uh, pull-based system. There's other scenarios when you get into insane, insane, insane scales, then streaming slash pull push as a mix might be better, but this is not something which is directly tied to pull to pull based. I, we hear this a lot, to be honest, but it's just not true. Um, you can just put more Prometheus servers, or you can just use Cortex or Thanos, and you're basically already done. Uh, uh, so the question is losing data when you're buffering in the client. Um, yes, if you have short-lived stuff, or if you have if your if your stuff dies so often, or in such a way that uh, that you actually lose 
data between the last pull and whenever you uh, whenever you would like to pull next and it's already died, yeah, then yes, that's a problem. So you need to engineer for that. Maybe you need shorter pull intervals. Maybe you need a push gateway. Uh, the push-based system has the same issue. Of course, if you die too early, um, where does the push go? It goes nowhere because you're not even pushing. So again, conceptually, that's, yeah. Um, and, and about the first question, um, are you talking about the Prometheus storage itself? Yeah. So the Prometheus storage itself is totally custom. Like we wrote all of that. Like it doesn't use influx, it doesn't use anything. So in order, like Prometheus has a mechanism called remote write um, and you can use that um, to write the time series data into whatever you want. Or just say it and I repeat. No, that's fine. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned the ability of um, being able to automatically detect ser uh, services and start pulling from them. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that ability or any configuration that's necessary? There is a system called service discovery built into Prometheus. Uh, for example, there's direct integration with Kubernetes. So you just tell Kubernetes and Prometheus about each other and they just start doing what you want to do. Um, there's tons of other integrations. For example, you have DNS where you just do a zone transfer and everything in that zone, Prometheus starts to monitor. Um, there's other integrations, uh, like the most important one to get started, unless you're using Kubernetes or zone transfer, is a file-based uh, one where you just have YAML. You just create that file and Prometheus starts pulling from those, uh, from those metric endpoints. Yeah, so let, let's let's do a, a a concrete example with Kubernetes. Uh, so the way it would work uh, with the Kubernetes service discovery is that you say you want to discover all endpoints objects, for example, or all pods, and then you can use uh, a system called relabeling in Prometheus to uh, decide which of those you want to keep or drop, for example. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, Prometheus basically goes ahead and asks Kubernetes, give me all the pods, and then you can use relabeling to uh, um, say you want only only you want to only scrape all the pods that start with some prefix or something like that. Like uh, all the metadata that like um, that is available through the Kubernetes API, you can make that use that for that decision making. Uh, so I kind of have two questions. One is, uh, so like if I'm monitoring something like CPU usage that can be fairly spiky, even you, within, I'm uh, sorry, uh, if I'm monitoring something like CPU usage that's fairly spiky even within a 15 second window, uh, do you recommend using aggregations or you do something over the, the time period? Do you usually use your application to know about those or, or kind of how does that work? So um, I think CPU is a good example because CPU uh, is typically accounted for as a counter, and so you would you you would always notice this spike because it's just CPU time total, and so it's it is basically an aggregation. In in some other systems, that this would be an aggregation because it's the aggregate of all CPU ever used of this process, right? And so you wouldn't lose that spike. But for other things like memory usage, you would have this. Um, and there are different metrics. For example, there's also a um, max memory ever used or something like that, um, which you could use to just detect spikes like that. Um, yeah. Maybe to, to extend a little bit on this, uh, we, have, we have certain data types, so to speak. They are all numbers, but still um, counters just go up. So number of days, they just go up. You never have less days when the world keeps turning. Um, temperature would be a gauge because it can go up and down. So you might not see the spike, how, how short it was, but you would not lose that information because you, basically you get that counter. And then once you have that counted data, Prometheus uses the rate function to actually show the graph of how it's changing over time. But on the database level, you just have this counter which just goes up, up, up. Does, does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, I'll get back to you. 
Yeah, I'll come around. On the topic of data types, it's only floats, I assume. Uh, what about like distribution types, so I can track request latency and such? We've got buckets, histograms. So okay. uh, that's where you would be putting them in. But they are already pre-aggregated. You already lost the, like the, the detailed data on those. But you basically um, have predefined buckets where you say lower equal 1, 2, 10, 5, whatever. And that's your latency or whatever. And then you just put them into those buckets. And that's how you do it. Um, so officially, we are out of time, but as we have the next talk anyway, as long as people keep quiet when they leave and enter, I would say we just continue. There was a question here. Hmm? You can, and I just repeat, that's totally fine. Uh, how would you compare this solution to using Elasticsearch, uh, Elkstack, and Beats? Also, something I've used in the past for monitoring. Elasticsearch focuses more on, on events. We focus on metrics. But I can use the beats and collect the CPU, RAM, et cetera, grab logs. There's like you know, metric beats, file beats, et cetera. So I've used them to monitor my infrastructure and use very similar time series processes. So the question is basically about beats within the Elk stack. Um, we scale better, but if, if that works for you, that's fine. So we are not here to convince anyone. We, no, uh, so I'm just curious. Yeah, no, we, we, we scale better, um, definitely. Uh, else, if you're happy. Do you, are you more space efficient? Because, you know, those. Yes. So like Prometheus is specifically engineered for metric data, right? Whereas Elasticsearch is a little bit more general purpose. And I think uh, that nature just allows us to, to do certain optimizations that they can't do. Um, that said, if that works for you, then you can stick with that. That's fine. Um, yeah. Not trying to be critical. Yeah, I yeah, know. Just curious. They're index independent. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, They're more flexible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I've got a follow up on the, um, Take the mic, please. Take the mic. For um, discussions, could you please move out? Sorry. I, I had a follow up on the service discovery um, topic. So you said you can get all the pods that you know match some uh, label or whatever, and you can just do those. Is that dynamic? I assume that's dynamic, so that over time, as more pods come up, it's not static. Yes, just based on what was in the beginning. You, you can make it static if you want to. It, it, you have regular expressions and such. Again, for a discussion, can you please, guys, for a discussion, can you please please move over? Thank you. Um, you can make it static if you really want to, but you have regular expressions and such, so you can do whatever. Okay, thank you. Great no talk. Uh, can you explain a little about the standard interface for defining metric? Like you mean open metrics? Uh, basically, what you saw earlier, how that looks. Um, there are some political issues with Product, uh, projects or companies supporting something which is competing and also a lot of traditional vendors like network vendors or hardware vendors don't really want to support anything unless it's an official standard. So basically to take all these considerations away we decided or I decided I want to have this new thing um, where you have this neutral brand under which you can put everything. And also I'll be working on RFC so once we have an actual RFC you can just tell your network vendor you have to su uh, support RC one two three, else I won't buy from you. And all of a sudden, you have contractually mandated that they have to support open metrics. So basically, it's it's um, th that's the political angle. The other thing is, um, within Prometheus, there is a ton of operational experience while designing all this. But yet, um, we were just a few people, um, uh, three or four people, maybe designed this thing, um, or maybe six, but. It, it's relatively limited in, even though there's a ton of operational experience, still it's it's relatively limited. So we wanted to widen the scope of others who want to work with us on this. And especially Google and Uber have put a ton of, of input into this where we can, where we could just see, okay, this is a valid use case which we're currently not covering. For example, we introduced the concept of exemplars where you can attach a trace ID to a certain histogram bucket. So you don't have to do correlation or search, you know directly in this latency bucket at that time I had that trace and you can jump directly. So these are a, a lot of small improvements which just make it easier and quicker 
It's also a li little bit quicker to parse. We removed tons of white space options, blah, 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 blah. It's just an improved version of, of what Prometheus has. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.